All right. So I will start by showing you some pretty pictures of Delphi and summarizing it related to all the stuff we've been doing. And then each one of you can give your response, either the response that you had before you came to the class or a response that you had after listening to what I say. Um, okay. So, um, I like going to Delphi. I've been there about 10 times. Um, all right. So, oh, let me do this one first. Sorry. Let's go to, oh, dang, I thought I had that. Wait a sec. I thought I had, okay. Um, okay, doesn't matter. All right. Delphi, here we go. All right. So we had the, if you remember, there are the 12 Olympian deities. So there's Zeus and Athena, the god and goddess of justice, Hera and Ares, honor, Artemis and um, Apollo. So I'm gonna go through all those and I'll show you at this site how nine of them have a presence. Like the, des the site is designed to bring these different energies to mind for the people who come there. So I think it's really amazing what they're doing. So, so one of the big themes that I started out, I talked about in Hesiod, in the creation story. If you remember, again, I don't blame you if you don't, but I hope this will help bring it to mind. It was a, a discussion of evolution, natural evolution and cultural evolution. So at the beginning was chaos, Gaia, Earth, Eros, creativity, Thanatos, destruction. Then this drama between creative and destructive plays out. And so then there's earthquakes and all that. And so all of a sudden the Earth has a history. So it goes from just cycles just earth and sky, earth and sky, year after year, uh, century after century. Well, then there start to be earthquakes. Okay, so there's a history there. All right, so then Kronos is born. Well, then Kronos has children. And so all, then there starts to be the relationship between the children. So all of a sudden, that's a higher level of interaction. And so, um, Kronos doesn't want that to happen. He wants control, but Zeus, you know, hides away. So Zeus comes back. He's the god of justice, okay? So there is a natural justice apart from the way any particular leader defines justice in his city. Then Zeus is afraid that he's going to get overtaken. Well, the truth is he is because every generation is going to get more complicated. So what happens is uh, one of his offspring or the offspring of his offspring. Um, so you remember Zeus and Apollo and all those guys. So now uh, Prometheus is, is born and he steals fire from Zeus and when human beings can steal fire, they can start to protect themselves. They're not so desperate. They don't have to just pray to the gods, please don't strike me with lightning. Please don't, <laughs> don't have a hurricane, don't whatever. Now the stories are telling you, well, you don't hurt Demeter, Demeter won't hurt you. But with Prometheus, he also can control a little bit. 
and Zeus doesn't like that. Um, but that's the next generation. So what dawned on Hesiod and the uh, pre-Socratics and the pre what dawned on people was from now on, every generation is going to be fundamentally different. So from we're gonna go from cycles of nature and cult culture to a linear history. And so, this was the location where the goddess, the great goddess, was worshipped. And she was protected by a snake. Well, the snake represents a cycle. The snake sheds its skin, grows a new skin, sheds its skin, grows a new skin. But it's the same every year, right? It's a one-year cycle that keeps repeating. So now Apollo is coming to the site. And he's, so the Python has been protecting the great goddess, fertility. The goddess who gave birth to, to sky, Uranus, gave birth to the whole universe, all the stars, gave birth to the beginning of all the natural world, gave birth to the emanations. Remember all the other goddesses are emanations from her in Crete. She gives birth to culture. I mean, she is the source of everything. But she was protected by the snake, and now she's going to be protected by Apollo. And this is the key, is that he protects her. He's not supposed to harm her, OK? But we know from Apollo, the stories of Apollo, the kind of Apollo, kind of person Apollo is, he has two major weaknesses. Um, one of them in Homer, and Homer talks about this. So again, that was that same 800 years BC. Homer um, talks about Apollo. He started out on the side that, that had the just cause. So one of the camps, one of the sides is right. They have justice on their side. But they started fighting. The leader cared more about power than justice. And they started fighting. So Apollo switched sides. So Apollo, the reason he did was over on the other side was Hector, who's, who loves Apollo. And he's a very disciplined guy and very organized guy. He kept the Trojans unified. He was a good leader until right toward the end. But anyway, so it's very important that Apollo doesn't care about justice. So if this is going to be Apollo protecting the goddess, it has to be Apollo that listens to Athena and listens to Zeus, right? So everything the priests say is filtered through, is honoring justice, all right? The other weakness of Apollo Remember, he chased girls. He was unfaithful. So he chased nymphs. And then if they rejected him, he took revenge. And that's right in the book. You know, I was just looking at the book again. And that's classic Apollo. And I think there are so many students that couldn't think of an Apollo. But in the last year, they could. And they all said, yeah, and he takes revenge, too. And it always throws people off that this really nerdy guy who's so accomplished has this woman problem. <laughs> but, you know, the Greeks didn't. They just thought that's that's the guy. You got to. So he has to develop a much greater respect for women. Right. If he's going to be protecting Demeter. There has to be a lot of influence of the goddesses there to make sure that he doesn't go overboard, doesn't use his powers for pleasure, sexual pleasure, at the expense of hurting women and children, um, or money, or power, or glory, right? Popularity, so fame. So how is the site set up? Okay, so number one, it was where the goddess had been worshipped. Number two, 
Poseidon, the god that's the counterpart to Demeter. He's the god of the earthquakes. There was an earthquake here, and that's why there's a crevice and the fumes come out from under the ground, okay? And that's the voice of Hades speaking. <laughs> so this is where uh, Poseidon has a presence and, and Hades has a presence. Uh, Poseidon also has a presence because he's the god of the sea. And so um, this picture on the right is actually the sea is right over there. I guess it's covered up with uh, a tree branch, but I'll show you another picture. Anyway, so, and there used to be a river flowing right by this site, but there's a lot of earthquakes and things shift over the millennia, but okay. So he's God of the sea and he's God of the earthquakes. And he also, um, there's a fresh water spring and if you live by the sea, it's very important. Uh, Greece is dry, dry country. So they needed fresh water to have Demeter's animals, right? And plants and human beings to grow. So in order to have fertility, Poseidon had gave them fresh water. So there's these two natural forces that are greater than human beings that ha have a really strong presence. So Apollo has to be in the service. You have to create a sustainable culture. You have to respect these two, these forces greater than you. Okay, so then the next one is Hades, the messenger from the gods. So um, he delivers a message. And so what it, the message is in the form of a riddle and I'll talk to you about that in a minute. But the idea is that the way the leader, the leader comes there for advice, um, the, the message here the, from Hades, the way the leader interprets that is going to be his legacy. It's going to be the story that he leaves behind. And so you better be very careful how you interpret it. Because Hades represents, after you die, what are people going to say about you, you know? You can be afraid of death, but you should be more afraid of what you leave behind because we all die. And then Persephone is the one who will punish you, right? That's different than what's your legacy is a different issue than are you going to personally be punished? The legacy is important because that's how you create a good culture. And that's what they wanted to emphasize is that you live your life in a way that creates a better world. So anyway, Hades is there. He's a presence. Then um, besides Apollo, the god of reason, Artemis is a presence because there the rituals to his sister Artemis, the goddess of the wilderness, they take place outside of the site, but there it is a site for worshiping Artemis. So once Apollo and Apollo's powers became, started to drive human history, he started, those powers uh, created cities. That's when people started to come together in big cities, right? Because science, technology, buildings, skyscrapers, you know, all that stuff is the Apollonian reasoning. So then there's going to be a split between the city and the wilderness. There really hadn't been that much of a difference. Small villages, you know, they just fit in. But now you've got this difference. But Artemis is honored, and she is the twin brother of Apollo. So she should get equal honor. Um, then there is, um, okay, Hestia. So when the, the leader of the city comes for advice, he goes into the temple and the flame, the eternal flame of Hestia. Do you remember? She's the one that sits at the heart and the flame represents the light of the mind. So the flame is kindled while people are talking. So in this class, hopefully, 
as students talk about, you know, the stories and their lives, something, you know, ignites and then you go, oh, that's like this and that's like this or, oh, I should think twice about this or that, right? That's exactly what's supposed to go on at the hearth. You, you ignite, you, you, you have that flame, it's an eternal flame, but all of a sudden, you know, it gets uh, kindled. You add <laughs> fuel to the fire and then Hermes takes that torch. So the leader comes here for some insight and then he takes that light like Hermes with the torch back to his city and he can shed light to his city to make good judgments. Again, it's the light of the mind. Um, then the big one here is Athena and Zeus. So when a traveler is coming from, from the inland, okay? It's at the sea, so you can get there th via the sea. But it all, if you're traveling inland, first of all, you go past the, the place that that's signifies whether or not it's literally historically true, but it's called the place where three roads meet, where Oedipus killed his father. And so on your way to Delphi, you can say, okay, Oedipus represents the guy who was really smart because he solved the riddle of the Sphinx, but he was not wise. He did not know himself. He did not know that he killed his father and married his mother, you know? And that's wisdom, right? Wisdom is when you become conscious of the way that your emotions are driven by your competition against your father for your mother's affection. Or, I mean, we've read so many archetypes of how those relationships at home poison a psyche and they take it out into the world and it poisons the world. So Oedipus didn't have a clue about that, even though he was smart. So on your way to Delphi, you have to make sure you're seeking wisdom. You're just not trying to interpret the riddle in a way that's like a puzzle. You're trying to be smart. Okay, then what you come to first, the gatekeeper is uh, a temple to Athena. So on the one hand, Athena, the goddess of wisdom and justice, she protects the site from outside threats. She's the gatekeeper. She lets you in if you, she thinks you're not gonna threaten the site. But she also gives counsel, right? Her shadow or her temple reflects onto Apollo. So Apollo has to remember <laughs> that he is accountable to Athena, okay? And then Athena, if you remember, she's the male identified goddess. Sometimes she, hangs, she supports the men too much and hurts women. This Athena, there are three altars to her in the temple and they're all her feminine side. So it's Athena as a fertility, her fertility side of her personality, her midwife side and her handicrafts. She's known uh, really well for her weaving. And so it's interesting because in the political realm, she weaves people together Then she goes home and she weaves cloth and then she gives that to people to help protect their bodies while she's also trying to weave their souls together uh, to have a flourishing culture. So anyway, Athena is a big, big, she's the gatekeeper, right? And then as they're walking up to the temple, they see the stone that Kronos swallowed. So I don't know if you remember, again, the story was that Kronos was threatened. He didn't want to get killed by his, his son, right? his father's son stuff that now we've read about, right? So he um, swallows, he eats his children, he devours them psychologically, which obviously fathers can do. Um, but especially Zeus type fathers, and a lot of you wrote about that, oh my gosh. They weren't always your fathers, but your friends' fathers, and my goodness. Anyway, so, so um, uh, 
Ray, his partner, his wife, uh, she tricked him. Uh, when Zeus was born, she wrapped the stone in a blanket and then Zeus went to Crete to get raised in a cave in Crete, okay? So the stone is there. And so it reminds the, the person coming for advice that Zeus is here, right? It's going to be justice, is going to be honored. And then the last one is Apollo and Dionysus. And if you remember, when we talked about, I just reread the, the section on Apollo, and it said that he is emotionally distant. And unless he can figure out how to become more in tune with his wife and family, either they resent him or they leave him. And so in midlife, he has a crisis, he's alone. Um, even if they're there, he can be em alone emotionally. So he should be having a crisis, even though he might not even notice because he's too out of touch. But the therapist, uh, it says right in the book, tries to get him to get in touch with his Dionysian self, right? His more emotional, spontaneous, crazy, silly, um, side of his person of his psyche. Well, at uh, Delphi, the temple, there's uh, friezes, right? So both two sides of the temple have that triangular shape where the roof is. And on one side, um, so for nine months out of the year, Apollo's oracle, the priests function, and then the fumes, uh, don't exist, they stop for three months because of the seasons. And so then the Dionysus takes over the site. So that's the message, you have to balance these things, which is you know, exactly what a therapist says. Like Dionysus has to get organized. Remember, Dionysus needs some Hermes, but especially some Zeus and some Apollo. That's what Dionysus needs, right? You gotta, have a strategy, you've got to get organized, you've got to have a plan, and you've got to, right, you've got to stop fighting against all authority, you have to be, obey some people, right? So they each need each other. Um, and Apollo, you know, dominates civilization more, but you've absolutely let, have to get Dionysus, give him his due. So on one side is Apollo with his mother, Lido and his sister. So it's male and female. And then he's dressed in a tunic, the same tunic as Dionysus. So Dionysus is the same size, the same tunic. And then Apollo has his favorite lyre that he plays his very organized, quiet music on. But he gives his favorite lyre to Dionysus. <laughs> Dionysus uses it to play his crazy orgiastic music on. And then Dionysus has women following him who are the Meneids, and they dance crazy wild orgiastic dances. So the big message, you know, the balance. I just think that's, I think it's incredible, but the therapists think, yes, this is very insightful. People do need these things and it's difficult. But anyway, so the site has the presence of nine deities. So it's all about balancing. Then there's the story of how the site began, okay? So there's, let's see. Um, all right. So he killed the snake, Apollo came he killed the snake, but then he had to do a penance because again, this is sacred. You have to be very careful not to kill Demeter. This is a very delicate balance. And he became a shepherd and a shepherd, again, is someone who domesticates animals for human consumption, but he doesn't abuse them, right? And then he brought back his mother, the source of life, fertility, and his sister. He integrated her into the site. Um, all right, then um, another really important thing. So we've been talking about Crete and the goddesses, right? 
So if the message here is, okay, we're going to replace the worship of goddesses, which everyone knew was Crete was the main center for that. We're going to replace it with protecting by Apollo, but they got the priests from Crete and Zeus was raised in Crete. And so they picked the first group of priests come from, from Crete and they were not military heroes, they were businessmen. And they were businessmen because they have traveled all around the area to do trade. They had, that's how their society flourished was through trade, friendship bonds with other countries. There was no sign of military, a military presence. It was a very, you know, peace loving, but very flourishing, very high level of culture and civilization. Uh, I showed you slides of that way back at the beginning. But anyway, they brought these businessmen because they would have an, an idea of international justice. They would be able to recognize the patterns in human affairs that occur everywhere they go, as opposed to the specific laws or practices or clothes or rituals, right? But it was those patterns that that the priests at Delphi had to understand, okay? So then Apollo turns himself into a dolphin to come to show them where the site is. He comes across the sea. And so they come in the sea and then they come there to found the site. Um, okay, let me just show you a few more pictures and then, and then I'll move on to the uh, to the lecture. Oh my gosh, what did I do? Sorry. <laughs> okay, we'll try again. Um, oh, here. Oh no, that's not right. Um, all right, I'm just going to do it this way because I don't want to. So this is Mount Parnassus, the highest mountain. So on the one hand, the sea is close by the highest mountain. And that's why there were earthquakes there, a lot of disruption. Here's the temple to Apollo. And here you have to walk up to it. Here's the place where, here's the stone that Kronos followed. Um, it was also called the navel of the earth. And it was also um, called the center of the world. There was a story that Zeus released two eagles. The eagle is, a, is an animal representing Zeus. And they flew in opposite directions and they ended up at Delphi. Um, there's the natural hot springs. There was where the women went into a trance. And so they, people thought this is where Hades, um, okay. And we have that story about Hades. Poseidon, the god of the earthquakes. See, there's the view from, I always take a hike that goes above the site where you can look down at the site, but then you can see the sea also. And there's Demeter, the goddess of fertility. Um, okay, and here's the story of the killing of the Python. Every year they reenact that story, um, you know, partly for tourists, but just to, to get people to think about what an amazing culture this is and the insights that we can still gain from learning about it. There's the shepherd, he had a penance. He returned with his mother, okay. There he is, there's the statue, um, the sculpture. He was, he had his own music and there's his lyre. Um, and he, this is considered the earliest music written on stone. Um, that's interesting. Um, and here there was a, a theater. So that's where you, you learn the plays and the plays remind you of all these mistakes. Uh, do you remember Dionysus was the one who died and was reborn? Actually, uh, again, another thing about the site is supposedly where Dionysus' body is buried at the site and then it, it's reborn again, which makes sense since this is where he's gonna govern after Apollo is done for nine months. Um, then the rule of reason, actually they have to walk past literally 
laws written in stone. <laughs> and there's an expression, right? The laws aren't written in stone. Um, but what this, what that expression means is that we have laws, but they apply generally. And, you know, the reason you have a, a trial and you have to bring your case to court and either a judge decides or a jury decides is because the laws are too vague and they're too universal and you have to apply them to a particular case. So on the one hand, they, here's the laws written on stone, but you're walking up to the temple to get your riddle and then you have to interpret the riddle. So you are the one who is the judge, but you're the judge of what it is you think you, you're supposed to be doing, right? So you are your own judge and your own jury. You have to internalize a love of justice so that you will interpret this riddle appropriately. Um, there's the Sphinx. Um, that was located there at the site, reminding people, okay, Oedipus solved that one, but blew it. Uh, there's Hercules. He was a flawed character. He, he ended up making this huge mistake, and he had to do a penance, 12 labors. So that's, each of those things represents various flaws people have that they have to get over, or very obstacles. Um, this one is the Apollo switches sides, the story of the Trojan War. Um, so uh, here's the stone that supposedly Kronos swallowed, um, reminding people that Zeus's presence is here. Um, there's the temple to Athena uh, with the altars dedicated to fertility. Um, Handicrafts and midwife. Um, oh yeah, okay, so there's the, the altars. Um, men disagree, everybody thinks they're just and good and that doesn't help. Um, just because you have good intentions doesn't mean you're right. It's, it's difficult that, and we, you know, you can picture that in, well, the, remember when we talked about Sophia talking to each of these goddesses and she thinks she's right, but then she has this weakness. And so they have to talk about it, figure this out. Well, the same when you're talking, when you read about the gods, you know that if your dad is Zeus, you're going to have these disagreements, right? And the dad is going to think he's right and he's blind, you know? So one of the biggest blindnesses is not to recognize that your kid has their own archetype. That's, that's what parents often just, they can't handle that. And so everything else becomes a disagreement. And, um, and life is just a lot more complicated than that <laughs> is the story, right? Um, Delphi was set up to promote justice. Um, priests, people came there for advice. Um, um, but they gave laws to various cities. It was like the United Nations. That's why the Greeks have all these flags there, right? It's just like it was the United Nations of Greece at the time. Um, okay, so now we are at the section about the history. The original priests were from the Minoan civilization, the goddess, female, female oriented. Um, they, they observed patterns. They didn't give the person, the leader came for advice, but they didn't give direct answers. They answered with a riddle. And so you are responsible for interpreting the riddle. I don't know if you've ever <laughs> had this experience of your parent or someone says something and you interpret it and that's not what I meant. <laughs> well, it's, I thought, that's what I thought you meant or that's what you said, uh, you know, so you're just responsible. Um, and before you get the riddle, you have to take a bath, cleanse your body, cleanse your soul. And it also has written in stone, know thyself, right? Know your strengths and weaknesses, know how 
your own blindnesses might cause you to interpret it wrong. And then nothing in excess. If you are greedy or power hungry, you will not interpret it correctly. Okay. Um, there was an Olympic stadium at Delphi because physical fitness, self-discipline are also necessary for wisdom. Okay, so here's the charioteer. He's holding over the image of a charioteer is he, had, he has these horses that are the passions and he has to rein them in and guide them, right? You have to guide your passions. Don't repress them too much. You can't hold the horses back or you're not going to get anywhere, but you can't let them give them too much free reign. Um, you win the race of life, right? Uh, okay. And here's the every, so every year they had us had a games, they had a physical um, event. Uh, it was held in Olympia once every four years, but it was also held in uh, Delphi was another place where they held games. Uh, everybody came, here's the camps. This is when someone comes to ask for advice, they stay over here in the camp. And while they're there, they develop friendship bonds with the other people. Um, so there's the Greek view of training for the noose for your intuition is um, tied to your emotions. So you can have all the arguments in the world, but you still end up making a bad judgment because you don't follow what reason tells you or because your reason is blind or limited. So you really need to develop both of those sides of your brain or your life or your emotions and your intellect. So a woman sits here, she inhales the fumes, goes into a trance, the priests interpret it, um, it honors Hestia. Um, here's one example of a riddle, which is a reminder to the other people coming. The king says, shall I go to war? And the priest said, if you go to war, a great nation will be destroyed. <laughs> well, of course, he thought, oh, good. The, the oracle told me we can go to war. It was like the great nation was his own nation. So be careful. Um, this is where people speak out. There's a place for people to talk about justice, to deliberate about human affairs. The priests had spies so that when they knew a king was going to come asking about, should I go to war? They would have information because even if a city state is being treated unjustly, if they're going to be completely wiped out, if it's not going to be an equal contest, then the priests will give advice that discourages them from that. Um, all right. And then, the, okay. So let me, uh, I don't think I'll do Socrates. Um, and I don't think I'll do Athens. Uh, I'll just do the goddess of health. This is a statue, you know, of a sound mind and a sound body. She's reflective. She's, you know, she just get, has it all together, integrity. All right, so um, the historical founding shows that they really wanted to honor that uh, culture in Crete that was based on women, but now it has to be integrated into this Apollonian, this more complex, uh, intellectual tools that human beings have just, they're awakened to their capacity for this and they're just gonna keep using it. So now it's just a question of reining it in, keeping keeping wisdom as the charioteer under control. Um, all right, now you can, it's your turn, I think. Um, oh, one other thing is that criminals would come there to for penance, for their judgment. And the, the priests ask, well, what do you think your punishment should be? And so the big leap here is that people have to learn to judge objectively and to be citizens. And the, the most 
the biggest case is if you can judge in your own case reasonably. If you can, then you can go back to your city state and actually be a citizen because now you get it. You have that level of self-conscious awareness, awareness of yourself as a citizen. You can participate in public life again. That is so different from the system that we have. Our system is so punitive and it just, it's really terrible. <laughs> but anyway, um, that, so the whole idea here is that heightened self-conscious awareness we can, we can create cities, we can be citizens, we can live at this higher level. Okay, now, um, your turn. Uh, let me stop sharing. And, okay, Lakin, what was your reaction when you read about Delphi? Anything? Okay, May. Um, okay, so for me, I I particularly like the um, the detail about the reader. I think so. Like, um, can you hear me, Professor? I think so. You're talking about? Did you say the riddle? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I say that I like I like that detail like the most um, because I think that life is like a long and complicated riddle. And I like the story of a ruler like coming to um, Oracle and asking for advice if he should go to war or not. And then the empire that fall is his nation, not the enemy's nation. I think that to really answer the riddle, the person, the ruler himself must go to um, his own self-examination and reflection. Like no one can give um, his the exact answer to him and I, I think in life it's also um to our like process of self self-reflection that we can find the answer like no one can really do it for us and i think um one more thing i want to say is that i think the site the oracle at delphine itself is the reminder of peace um and to do that we really need to go to the purification like we cannot only like follow the um our our own like custom or habit and like um forget other because to really conform to international like um justice we really need to like um i don't know how to say that but i i, I feel that if we just follow our own like tradition our own custom and habit we really we cannot really achieve that because people are very diverse and cultures are very diverse and we really need to care about other people as well. And um, as and if a ruler, if, if someone is a ruler, they really need to um, be responsible for their citizens and not only like manipulate them or like overuse the power um, themselves. So that's what I think after reading and hearing what you said. Very good. Now, now I hope you link that to that paper I had you write about yourself, right? So, so kind of self-reflection that I'm asking you to do throughout the class, that's, that's what this site represents. Is everybody, I hope people understand that. Do you understand that, May? Yes, yes, yes I understand. <laughs> yeah, and then also one, one last thing I should have mentioned is that they were religiously tolerant, right? They don't, uh, you know, and so religious toleration is necessary. None of this using religion as a weapon to justify your superiority over somebody else, right? Yes, yes. Ah, that's so important. Okay, Madeline, what have you got? So one thing that um, I guess like really stuck out to me when I was reading today was that basically like it's important to know uh, the issues that's going around in the world um, because like, I guess you have to know what's going on in order to be able to like help out in that in certain things like that and be able to speak your mind about I don't know stuff like that. That's what really stuck out to me. And also have informed decisions, right? Yes. Or at least when you hear people talking about stuff, 
at least say, are you sure you know that much? <laughs> does that make sense, Madeline? Yes, it does. Yeah, like intellectual honesty. It is important for us to know international affairs, but let's make sure we know what we're talking about or we can say it is important and I wish I knew more. I wish I could find out more, but at the moment, I'm not gonna, you know, go out there and start claiming to know stuff. Um, that just does a lot of damage. Good, Madeline. Okay, Elizabeth, what have you got? Um, I guess mine kind of goes along with what Madeline said. I really like how specifically the older Olympic games put so much emphasis on um, like relations between countries and how we could probably do better to make them better, you know? Um, but it seems like they had really good, like inter, I don't know the word for it, but relations between countries. And there's so much like tension now between different countries. And I feel like some, we need to work towards something that can help better that. Well, the truth is they weren't such goody two shoes, right? Well, yeah, they just, it just seemed like they were. Well, at least the message from the wise people, right? Yeah. We should, I mean, at least the message from the founders, right, is pretty clear. And, and we're in America, we're just even messed up about the founders. They were not fundamentalist Christians. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I mean, we're just really messed up in our understanding of who we are as a country and also uh, human nature, right? And culture. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sam, what you got? Um, I don't know. Liz and Madeline kind of said everything that I was thinking. Um, I guess the only thing I could say to add to it would be, I think hmm, currently like the US and other countries have almost too much focus on themselves and that we should deter some of that focus in order to maintain better relationships with other countries because we're so focused on like, I, I know there's a word for it. I heard it all the time in my science, in my political science classes and I cannot remember it. It's almost like patri like being patriotic, but like there's a more like scientific word for it. <laughs> well, it's national. I'm sure. it's national. Think nationalism. nationalism okay yes. okay we're, we're too nationalistic right now we need to calm it down in order to have better relationships with other countries sure i mean it was america first right yeah make america great again well the trouble is that's putin make russia great again right and that's china they go back to the their golden age we're gonna make china great again okay like, you know, <laughs> yeah, really? By, you know, having all this animosity, uh, I'm not sure, right? Um, anyway, that those are, is that kind of what you're getting at? Yeah. Okay. That history will say that about us, yes. Um, okay, Nahida, what have you got? Are you there? Okay, Bondona. Ma'am, I didn't get anything. Okay. Um, Guntari. Yes, Professor. You got something? Yeah, yeah. Um, for me. I like how they illustrate the transformation from being protected by natural forces to being protected by intellectual forces. Like how they use the Python as a protector and then come Apollo, a smart boy who has a rational mindset. It shows how people develop and use their minds more than their strengths like before. Also, when it says that the power of human choice is a major them in the operation of the site. Uh, I think it will lead them to a democratic system later. Yeah. yeah. 
Yep, that's a major theme is that we, at least the general thing is that Athens was a democracy, but a lot of stuff was happening way before Athens, right? Yeah. Yeah, the, the constitution of Lycurgus, there were these ecclesia of citizens that met and the rulers had to present proposals and they had to approve or reject them. I mean, that's democracy, guys. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so I, I hope that those of you in developing countries can understand that this is, a, this is a nice guide for the direction that you want your countries to go. And that, you know, the Greeks were, were talking about this a long time ago. So you don't have to just use the US or you don't have to try and find some contemporary country as if, you know, it's never happened before. I mean, Greece had its, you know, flaws in terms of how many people actually voted, but the ideas there and that level of self-conscious reflection and thinking like a citizen and overcoming uh, your patriotism, right? That stuff is so profound and it was so long ago. And Greece has, people have come to Greece to be inspired by this culture for 2,800 years. That's what I, that, that's what I, and I actually, Untari, in Indonesia, I would talk about this and the other colleagues, you know, they loved my lectures. They really did. It was a wonderful thing. Um, anyway, so, okay, Claire, what you got? Um, like the other one student said, it, it kind of beat me to a few of my thoughts, but um, a big takeaway that I had was, and it's one that's just been a takeaway from all of my philosophy classes, especially world philosophies, was just the, the process of self-examination. And like you're saying, holding people accountable through the intellectual honesty, things like that, examining yourself and others and holding yourself and taking on the responsibility of holding others accountable to it as well, I think, because it's easy to just be like, well, they're wrong, but I'm not going to say anything. And that's the part of kind of continuing the problem. So I think that is a big takeaway for me. Good. A uh, lion has this five qualities of character and they're really good. Commitment to truth, intellectual honesty, fairness to opposing points of view, patience with complexity and ambiguity, tolerance of reasoned dissent. You don't have to tolerate somebody if they say, I know you're gonna to go to hell, Dr. Beck, because you're not you know, enough of a Jesus freak. <laughs> but um, I tolerate it anyway, you know, it doesn't matter to me, but sometimes, you know, you can't tolerate someone who kills someone for their religion, you know, uh, and that gets tricky, but it's much, it is good. Those are good qualities. We just have to try and live up to them and they, and we can't have a democracy without them, right? It's, we're going to lose our democracy if we don't have those traits. Um, let's see, Al, what have you got? I really like reading about Delphi because I think you remember um, uh, the paper I wrote about it. But um, uh, something that kind of stuck out this go around is uh, there's kind of like an, a museum of human history kind of vibe going on at Delphi because you have all these artifacts. So you have the navel of the world. And you're kind of seeing where all the stories take place. And it kind of brings on the feeling of being in, in like a museum almost. So um, I think in Greek culture, that probably really resonated a lot to be able to stand there where all the stories that you're told took place. You know, I think that has to be a really like humbling experience. Yeah. I mean, it really, even now it is, you just feel this presence. <laughs> um, but I'll tell you that the problem here is that you could take all those archetypes and tell the story of human history through those lessons, but that's not what the historians do. I don't know any historians that do that, right? Because we've lost it. 
we don't actually, you know, think about how profound and how true to life these stories are. We, you know, in the modern world, oh, those are myths. That means they're false science and they didn't know science and they're ignorant. And we've moved totally past that, which is really sad. Um, so Margia, what have you got? Okay, uh, DT. No, I didn't get it. Okay, uh, Fahima. Are you there, Fahima? Sometimes she has electricity problems. Okay, Rossi, have you got something? Hi, Professor. Um, after reading, I feel similar to what I feel that this is kind of like a museum of a lot of history going on. And it also reminds me of when I go to the temples in my hometown, like because I live in like a historical site in Siem Reap. So every time I go there, it kind of reminds me of the history of my people, all the wonderful kings who have made Cambodia great at a at one point in history where we govern like Thailand, Laos and parts of Vietnam. And it shows the glory and kind of, this is seen through this piece of writing of what um, the Greek culture was like at one point in history too. Okay, I, again, I think that when I was in Czech Republic, for example, they had King Wenceslas and they had some museums and you know they were talking about him and it was interesting because the reason he was a good king he ruled for the sake of the rule ruled right and you could just put on these these greek categories and that is what they were talking about but they never say there there is this foundation and there is this conceptual framework according to which we can look at these different leaders and the reason to do that is so moving forward, right? We can have some idea of what character traits to take with us, how to imitate, but we can say it in an argument form, not just what did he do and is it like this, right? You can define it and then you can, it's, it's clearer going forward. Um, does that make sense to you? Yes, Professor. Okay, Rupia, do you have something? Okay. All right, so the next one is Olympia, the Olympic Games. Um, so I hope, I hope you liked the story of the Olympic Games. Um, no. Yes. Um, all right. So again, I'm going to I'm going to talk about it in terms of the presence of all those different um, deities. And I think this is what the Greeks were thinking about. So. Um, so again, it's OK, let me just tell the story first and then we'll go through the slides. But you have that same theme of having the city states come together, just like a democracy, right? They all come together. They're going to form a community based on common laws that they themselves have made for themselves. They agree to live by these laws. Then they appoint judges to make decisions in particular cases. And um, so they set this up. It's very amazing. I think way before Athens, I mean, I'm kind of disgusted with Athens. First of all, they destroyed their democracy. But second of all, I was taught, you know, that they were the first blah, blah. And actually, they were just sort of a natural extension of, of a centuries long tradition. So another thing really important, originally, it was just some running races of women, running races. They were for the young 
uh, pre-menstrual women, the you know fertile women, middle-aged women, and older women, and it was run by Hera. And so I think you know the thing that works for me is that she was the goddess of honor. So it's honorable to be physically fit, right? It's a part of human excellence, but you would never make it into a law. <laughs> you know, you must come to the gym and exercise 30 minutes a day or you get a fine or something. I mean, it's one of those things where we depend on each other to stay physically fit. It affects the society. It affects our healthcare costs. It affects uh, people's attendance, ability to get to work, you know, and so we depend upon it. It should be honored. Um, okay, so again, 800 BC, this awareness of our Apollonian powers. So they created this community using these Apollonian powers. Um, let's see. Um, all right, so at the, at the site, the, there's a temple, there was a, a big column to Hera, but the temple is to Zeus, not to Apollo, it's to Zeus, because the focus of this is this um, justice. Everybody having a common body of laws, applying it. Also, um, the Zeus and Apollo archetypes, but especially Zeus, this is an incredibly complicated uh, uh, event, right? You've got to have, you've got to be really organized. You have to have a lot of laws and a lot of policies. Over here in Aaliyah, uh, there were the practice fields. So the athletes came six weeks ahead. And then the, there were people running the site, the justice, you know, representing justice that would look and see the level of competition because somebody who was the best wrestler in one city state would come over here and he would probably get killed because he's not good enough. And so they would see the level of uh, how well they were and they wouldn't, you know, some of them that really weren't good enough wouldn't get in because they would get killed, <laughs> literally killed, right? They just were really way worse. So all of that stuff went on over there. Then you have to have who's going to, you know, all this sleeping and campsites and getting people together and getting the coaches together, um, getting, you know, it's just really complicated, way more complicated than Delphi, right? Delphi is just one, you know, or a few, one person at a time comes to ask for the riddle. This one is this huge thing. So that's why I think Zeus is the main, uh, is the main guy. Like this is the temple to a Zeus. Um, also, it's not Athena because being physically fit and having an organization and all this stuff with the goal of just physical achievement is not wisdom, right? But it is, it is a kind of justice and it is bringing people together they form friendship bonds. So this is a big way to prevent war because you weave people together, right? Remember, that's what, that's also what Hera did, weaving people together. Um, but she, um, so, you know, this is happens in the Olympics now, the athletes meet the athletes from a different city state and they realize I'm a lot like that guy, he's really competitive and so am I, you know, or boy, he's really talented and I got to do better or I like the way he does this or that, right? And so um, they're less likely to kill each other, right? People fear what they don't understand. They fear people they don't know. So not only have they met this pe these people, but they, they're soulmates, right? So the athletes bond with athletes and the coaches bond with coaches and the trainers um, and then the judges you know, every city state comes with its people to fill all the different roles. Um, so it's a way to prevent war. Um, at that time, you had to have your young men had to be physically fit because if you needed to be in a war, you got they've got to wear armor and you know. So 
it's a way to be physically fit without having a military school. So not only is it not patriotism, you know, get physically fit for your country, it's also all this bonding to prevent war and to prefer diplomacy. Um, okay, the, uh, the other thing, the next thing is that respect for the laws was incredibly important. If a judge took bribes, some, I mean, I read that they, capital punishment, like they were killed for it, but I mean, severe punishment. If somebody cheats, um, their, their name is written in stone. So that's their legacy. <laughs> and so it's interesting, you know, in Delphi, the laws are written in stone. In um, Olympia, the cheaters' names are written in stone. And then if they go home to their city state, their names get remembered, I would imagine, written in stone. And that's their legacy there. So it's all about legacy. And it's about you represent your city state, not just yourself. It's not for personal glory only, it's for your city state. Um, that, so legacy is a big deal. That's Hades, right? Persephone, you get punished severely. Um, you try to preserve world peace. Um, and then, you know, you can read history where it got corrupted. So, so I'll explain that to you in a minute. But there's also the Olympic torch. Now this stuff should start dawning on you. Oh, torch, <laughs> not this again, right? The Hermes. So he comes through the city states and they have a truce, right? They don't fight. Um, and then he gets there and at the gatekeeper, just like Athena is the gatekeeper in Delphi. So Hestia is the gatekeeper here. And so there's her, her temple and then the flame is kept there. And you know that when you do the Olympics, somebody lights the Olympic flame as, oh, but I mean, it's way more than just some kind of a, a flame, right? It's the light of the mind. It's sound mind and the sound body. It's the love of justice. It's learning how to be objective, to get over your preference for yourself, to get over nationalism, to get over patriotism. Um, Let's see, um, Hermes and Hestia. Um, there's a, there's a, uh, an altar to Demeter right on the running track. So that's again, Demeter, the relation, unification of nature and culture. So at Delphi, Apollo protects the goddess. At um, Olympia, the goddess is present as um, our natural bodies are are um, within it, are, you know, you set up a cultural event, which is all these games with all their rules and policies, that's cultural, but you're starting out with your body. So she's uh, a presence there. Um, let's see, okay. So the other, oh yeah. And then another big thing is that the, the local villagers, both in, Delphi and Olympia, the villagers were given a whole lot of uh, participation in taking care of a site, in um, managing the site. In Aaliyah, the villagers, um, actually, I think they managed the practice grounds, but it was, again, this idea of democracy, that even the ordinary person was engaged and had their responsibilities. So you try to give as many people as possible an opportunity to participate in this city. Um, so, um, so, I mean, it's basically a part of celebrating our humanity, right? Human excellence, every kind of excellence. This is Greek humanism. Like being human is a phenomenal thing. It has, it's very complex. When it's good, it's really good. But of course, every, every way in which it can be really good, it can go wrong. So when it's bad, it's really bad. And there's a lot of ways to go wrong. But in the end, you know, you wanna celebrate humanity, but it has to be a sustainable culture within the context. Um, you want to, and again, religious toleration, right? You tolerate 
it's pluralistic, just like Delphi. Uh, you, it's different ethnicities, different religious practices, but here's the common bond, right? We all have this in common. And so I think it just teaches people right away, similarity and difference, similarity and difference. And the similarities are the most important for preventing war, for promoting flourishing, for weaving us together. And so with that in mind, I do want to say it got completely corrupted. And so that's what the stories you hear is that each athlete came with their own entourage, okay? Each athlete had a coach, a trainer, and then this other guy that when they're practicing, they put oil on their bodies, but it's dusty. So they get, you know, it's like mud. So there is one, the athletes would have this guy with this little sickle thing to like scrape, <laughs> scrape the, you know, the dust off the body and they just got way too specialized and it costs too much money and all that stuff. And that should sound familiar, right? There's the gymnasium, the training. Um, oh my gosh, okay. Then there's the priest. So this is a sacred place. The priests are there. There's the baths. Uh, the worship statue of Zeus was created, the workshop, very famous statue. He was a very, you know, renowned sculptor. Um, there's a guest house. There's the council chamber. They swore the oath, right? This is sacred ground. You swear that you won't cheat. Um, the stoa is where things were being bought and sold. You know, there's people all over the place. <laughs> and you have to have, you know, food and um, I don't know, maybe uh, hats to keep the sun off. There's the altar to Artemis. So there is a place where there's culture and there's nature, Artemis. Um, there's another stoa. This is the crypt. This is the famous thing you always see because you walk through that and there's the running track. Um, that's where the altar to Demeter is. Um, the Hippodrome is next to the stadium. Statues of Zeus dedicated to athletes who are fined for cheating. Uh, the treasuries, um, there were treasuries um, in Delphi too, where the city states would bring stuff worth money, right? Because uh, they wanted, you know, good reputation. Temple to S Sybil, mother of the gods, so the presence of the goddess. Um, this is to the nymphs, but that's later. He's a Roman. Uh, temple to Hera, statue of Hermes. Um, okay, altar to Zeus next to Hera's temple. Um, all right. What happened is the Romans, you know, everybody afterwards wanted to, to get in on the, the action and build their own building there. Um, this is where the Hestia's flame is. Um, this, the temple to Zeus is right in the middle there. Okay, so now you guys turn. Um, Lakin, did you come up with something? I don't hear. Okay, May, did you have something? Well, um, I don't know why, like the Olympia contest reminds me of many national and also international contests and competition like existing nowadays. Like usually the contest um, is not for people like competing against each other, but to raise people's awareness and also like uh, forming like the close bond between people like caring about something like together. Um, for example, like there are some of the like designing contests like with the team about climate train to gather people who care about climate and some of the environmentalists kind of like that. Um, but I think that the point like how people perceive about the competition because for many people they really want to like make connection with people with the same vision like the vision careers but for some people they consider it a way to like um, to show power and like to just like compete and don't care about the message and any other things like above that so that's why there are some of the like um, cheating or like disrespecting the law and like the rules kind of like that so I think that um, um, every competition is like um, 
the it's, it just depends on like how people perceive it. I think at its root, it is try uh, is trying to um, connect people together and to promoting like sustainability. But maybe some people like misunderstand it and misuse it as a way to like uh, abuse power, kind of like. That's very good. Actually, there were contests in music and reciting Homer too. So yeah. I do, I do think I was too young. There was no sports for girls. There was the only contest I was ever in was speech, you know. But um, yeah, I do think contests should be more about finding vision carriers and soulmates and creating a community of like-minded people, right? And um, and then it always it can go bad though into power and glory and stuff like that. So it is really interesting, I think, that all the basic patterns were there 800 BC, right? And we yeah, still have. Agree. <laughs> it's so amazing variations on a theme. And so in your posts, you could think of some contest that you've been in or you know of, and just see how all the patterns. I would love to read that. That would be great. Okay, Madeline, you got something? Yes, uh, something that I had read that I thought was kind of like, uh, I guess funny was uh, like how the athletes performed naked. And like in today's society, like if you were to perform naked or even show skin, you're kind of shamed, body shamed for it, no matter like what your body type is. So I kind of, I just thought that was kind of funny, I guess. <laughs> Well, that is so consistent with the beauty of the body, right? It's anti-Puritanism. It's just you affirm a beautiful body. It's Aphrodite and Hephaestus. You're a craftsman of your body. And there's nothing. Yeah. I just think Puritanism is not healthy. Anyway, good. Uh, Bondona, do you have something? Oh, that's right. Elizabeth had to leave. I forgot. Um, no, ma'am. No? Okay. Um, Untari? No, Professor. I don't know. Okay. okay. Claire? I was going to pass this round too. Sorry. Okay. Um, L? It's really cool seeing that I'm. Uh wrestling has survived pretty much really close to what it was in the Olympic Games today. And uh, I don't know, I, I feel kind of cool participating in a sport that's been in existence that long. Actually, I mean, one thought I had is the reason is that you've got, you're supposed to carry uh, armor. You're supposed to wear this armor in a war. So you really need to be, have every muscle. <laughs> But I actually, I think wrestling is great because every muscle of your body is tested, right? And at a more intense level than any other sport. I think it was um, Aristotle that said, not even the greatest runner could rival a wrestler. Well, Plato had a reputation as a wrestler. Uh, so yeah, wrestling was really like the top sport uh, for that reason. Um, Rossi, do you have something? Um, as for me, when I read about the Olympic Games, although like I support the Olympic Games, but sometimes I feel like when it is diverted from its original aim to promote world peace, and then people started to become so focused into like developing their skills, and so basically they spend their whole lives training for that game every four years I feel like they're losing a sense of purpose in their life and they're not doing what they actually like I feel like to that extent they are just harming their own body meant for them well the main thing is the same thing happened in in Greece they got so over specialized Plato talks about it that they weren't even healthy because they had to have this very careful regiment. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was supposed to be overall wellness, right? And the same thing has happened now. And the city states spend all their money on having this huge party. And in the, you know, the Greeks would come there and party basically. 
So the athletes were over specialized. Everybody else was a couch potato and was drinking and carousing around. So what else is new? <laughs> it is discouraging, Rossi. You're right. Uh, Rupia, you got something? Uh, Jana Tool. Professor, I don't have anything now. Okay. Uh, Fahima. I don't know if she's there. Um, what about DT? Are you there? Okay. Um, all right, so we have a couple minutes. I had another thing that I just added um, that was a student from last year. I wanted the AUW students to take note. Um, she really, really liked Delphi. Um, and so she said, I go to my current Delphi, which is AUW where a lot of students from different places come for education and the pursuit of wisdom and justice, now understood as equal rights, which is really true. I mean, this was amazing. This was her post, right? Uh, wisdom is different from knowledge. Um, many years ago, not everyone could understand the speech of the priest. Similarly today, not every student achieves wisdom after she graduates. It's not gained only by being taught, memorizing, but by experience. Those seeking wisdom need to reflect on their events, think about the reasons, deciding how to act, consider the consequences. The wise artists from the past taught us about these patterns. We can learn, we can learn the lessons. Um, so the ancient Greeks discussed everything, the market, the, the pub, uh, now the AUWs can talk in the lane in the dining hall in their rooms. The same is true of Lion. She said, I want to listen to my friends and express my ideas. But when I sought out people to talk to, I didn't find many people discussing ideas. They spent time on entertainment, worrying about their grades. So she's inspired to create an AUW talk club. Okay. So I don't know if you know Sue, she's from Vietnam, but if you see her and you want to just say, hey, Sue, let's do it. Um, so I asked her if it was okay if I shared it with other students. So she said that was okay. But really, you should think about it, you all, that you AUW. And then the Lion students, we have an RPH uh, club. And it never seems to get off the ground enough, but it could. Um, so that's that. Um, and then I also put on here, let's see, I don't know if you noticed it, um, a letter that I sent to the students. And um, you could include this in you know responses to this in the post, or you can do it uh, in your final paper. You can think about it. Um, so this was after everybody had to go home after COVID. Um, and so let's see, what I said was, um, how is it that you can take those goddesses and make them, activate them, right, in the time of COVID? How is it that COVID is sort of forcing you to be more Artemis, right? And all of you guys, so this is, you're, you've been through a year of COVID stuff. And um, so getting your Artemis energy in gear um, and creating this sisterhood, getting your Athena in gear um, and, and Aphrodite. So what you could do that's interesting to me is that this is anticipate, this is responding absolutely in the moment at the time. And then now figuring out, well, what's been happening over the last year? Um, and what I want to ask you about this time is when COVID is over, we should not go back to the same world. It's not the same world. And I know that where I live, 
people are terrified at change and they're going to fight as hard as they can so that their lives are not different. And the truth is, all of our lives need to be different. And I, especially for people in your generation, if we don't change to sustainability, if we don't wake up to um, racism and the gaps between the rich and the poor all over the world and within countries, if we don't change our economic systems, <laughs> you're toast, right? Your generation is absolute toast. So I just want you to think now. So that was the letter about how are you gonna deal with COVID? It's right, whammo, complete surprise. Now it's gonna be, how are you gonna deal with after COVID? What are you gonna to do to get yourself and you know everything you touch at a higher level of consciousness, a more international consciousness, right? Where you're reflecting on, um, especially you know the sustainable issues and the the breakdown in the economic systems that we've had and capitalism has not been adequately regulated right we don't want socialism with no you know where the government controls everything about the economy but we cannot have this capitalism that's exploiting nature it was based on endless exploitation of nature we can't we got to stop so just your idea not just the capitalism but also politics or male female relations or race relations or relations between countries or whatever it is that you think covid has exposed and that you think we have to change moving forward and this again can affect you and your thoughts about your career not might be what you do, but it also it just could be the way you do it or the other things you talk about at the taverna and the pub and the talk club, right? Because you can't, your own job is going to be a tiny little drop. But all the other ways that you can contribute to culture, that's what uh, you, you, you might want to write um, your final paper should be sort of, or it can be, I don't know if I'm going to require it. But if that's something that you would like to spend some time thinking on, you can put it in your post, but you can jot notes for your final paper because your final paper is your wrap up about the whole thing. So anyway, it's time to go. And I appreciate your comments. And um, I will see you in a couple of days. And that's where we're gonna be going through all the virtues and vices and um, you're brainstorming about how they play out in your life and then tragedy. All the ways we have good intentions and we make mistakes and we have really good reasons for doing something really stupid. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Uh, by, by, by the way, Professor, like uh, Louis, like another classmate, like in this class, like from Vietnam as well, like she said that today she lost the electricity, so she couldn't enjoy the class. So she will send a mail to you to confirm later. But she told me to tell it to you. Yeah. Okay. Is that Louis? Yeah, yeah, Louis. Yeah, I figured, you know, because she's usually here. Um, yeah. You could also tell her that if she wants to talk about Delphi or Olympia next time, she should remind me and just, you know, it's fine with me. Uh, okay, okay. okay. I, I will tell it to her. Thank you. Sure. Goodbye, Professor. Have a nice day. Yeah, you too. Um, news rot. Is news rot there? Rupia, are you there, Jana Tool? Do you have any questions?
Oh, I have to stop the recording. <laughs>